Welcome to the Masters of Beautiful Achievements podcast, where we share the insights from inspiring masters about how the use of physics, biology, and green chemistry is shaping our future. It's all you need to know about innovation and better business models. The podcast is hosted by Alexander Prince, founder of Scope Matters. For more inspiring episodes, visit the Master of Beautiful Achievements website. My name is Alexander Princeton, and I'm a managing partner of Scope Matters. And with Scope Matters, we help business leaders bring clarity how they can generate more circular cash flows, eliminate waste, and at the same time do better. Because all matter counts once you see it. I'm also a part-time teacher in Leeward at the University of Applied Sciences at Van Hal Aderstein. And from a physical point of view, I'm based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. With Mark and Richard, I will explore from a very curiosity perspective what we can learn from viruses. And who knows, we might discover one of two innovative applications along the way. So Mark and Richard, may I ask you both to introduce yourself briefly before we start our exploration? Thank you, Alexander. I'm Mark van Bemmel. I'm a founder and owner of Orvion. Orvion is a young biotech company, a startup actually. We're based in Stolwijk near Gouda, where we run our own laboratory and we do a lot of work on uh, microbial degradation of all kinds of contaminants in the environment. So uh, microbes can do a lot of work to uh, increase the health of our planet. And um, also we use a lot of DNA technologies in our laboratory to be able to analyze these bacteria. From that point of view, I'm really interested in viruses that are active in bacteria. So actually those are called bacteriophages or phages in short. So phages are a very omnipresent kind of virus attacking bacteria and they can be very useful. And we'll, I hope to talk about that during this meeting. My name is Richard Kormeling. I'm an associate professor at the Wageningen University. So that's actually also the place where I started my study. I performed a PhD and formed a postdoc, even went to England for a short postdoc period. After that, I returned, which was in the mid 90s, and then I became a staff member of the Laboratory of Virology. So maybe I just immediately kick off. So when we talk about viruses, and for those interested in some history as well, because we can talk about everything, isn't it? I think it's nice to report that actually virology, the discipline of virology, was more or less founded in the Netherlands, in Wageningen, where farmers, more or less at the end of the 19th century, complained about a disease they saw in tobacco cultivations. So yes, we were even growing tobacco in the Netherlands. They called it a mosaic disease. And guys like Bayerink, Ivanovsky and Meyer, they actually perform basic research and discover that actually we were facing an agent causing a disease in tobacco, which was even smaller than bacteria. So really that small. So initially they called it virus, which is what Alexander discovered earlier today. It's a name standing for poison. Initially they even thought it was fluid, but it was actually only in the 1930s by a German electron microscope, they actually observed really small particles. That was the first discovery and the establishment of a virus particle, really smaller than bacteria. And it was in the 1980s that molecular tools, as we would say, so molecular biology, molecular genetics and biology, allowed us to further study the very details of viruses. Mostly in those days and still up to now, actually, when people talk about viruses, they look at viruses from the point of disease, which is actually slowly changing because in the past two centuries, people also slowly see that viruses are not just only harmful, causing for disease. We see examples that viruses can be beneficial. So if I would just report two examples in plants that I know of is that people have served, especially during breeding programs, that wild cultivars where some of those were having a small persistent infection with a certain group of viruses, that during breeding programs, they eventually noticed that their new breeding lines contained more of these viruses. And they actually saw that this was correlated to the fact that they were selecting for bigger seeds 
faster germination times, higher offspring. So really viruses in that case turned out to be beneficial. Another example I can clearly give is the situation where plants, and maybe this is relevant in, in light of climate change, that plants suffering from drought and heat, some of those become more resilient to the drought and heat circumstances when they're infected by viruses. So no viruses way. can even be very beneficial to plants as well. And for sure, there are examples, although we may not know them all, in animal and many other systems as well. So viruses, we surely should not look only from the perspective that they're a disease making. They're for sure, they're beneficial. Yeah, and Richard, I looked up on the web this today and I found a quote that they are estimated of 10 to the 31th viruses on the planet. <laughs> uh, with, with, yeah. which, and they are they outnumber bacteria by 10 to 1 which is like I think they wrote down it's like you, if you stack them all behind each other it's like 5 light years long yes <laughs> and that's probably but Mark knows as well I mean the biggest group if you take a sample of the ocean full of yeah. bacteria then besides the bacteria you will find a there lot more, of viruses even, there Infecting yeah, in, the, tell me more, more bacteriophages. Yes, in, in water you you generally find uh, something in clean water. You find something like ten to the fifth, so one hundred thousand uh, bacterial cells per milliliter, and uh, you would find uh, about a factor thousand more phages. So uh, there's a lot of bacteriophages uh, present, and uh, actually, if you count them as life, as to see them as a life form, they are the most abundant life form on Earth. What are bacterial phages? Are those purely infecting bacteria? Yeah, yeah. Those are viruses that infect bacteria. There are so many species that we do not even begin to have an idea of how many there are. Yeah, because I understood we have bacteria, viruses that kill bacteria. We have viruses that go for fungi, we have viruses that go for algae, for plants and animals. Yeah, and usually they target those very specifically. So, yeah. Yeah, so as you already pointed out, actually, any organism you name, there is definitely a virus for it. So, fungi, nematodes, insects, animals, humans, plants, algae, amoebae, there are all viruses for these. What is the role of a virus then if a virus is part of every kingdom of the planet? Well, that's a very good question. I will not have a straight answer there. What is the role of the virus in, on Earth at all? I don't know. The only thing we know is by studying is that we see that viruses are basically elements, genetic elements like yeah. RNA, DNA. Mostly they're surrounded by a kind of protein shell, like as if they wear a raincoat to protect them somewhat from the environment. And normally they don't do anything because they are not able to multiply themselves. They have to enter a cell in order to use the machinery of a cell to multiply. That's what they actually do. So in general, we would define them as genetic elements that once in a cell they just multiply, and if this really goes on, eventually the amount of viruses in a cell can be huge, leading to the cell to die and to explode more or less and release a next generation of virus particles to the surroundings. Yeah, so they sort what of they hide themselves and then replicate, and uh, there are many more uh, duplicates of the same virus that enter the but cell. Yeah. For those listening, what is RNA and what is DNA? I know they are forms of acids. Yes. RNA and DNA, we call them, in biology terms, we would call them languages. You could put it simply. <laughs> if you speak Spanish, you have to translate it into French or into Dutch, whatever. So the basics in eukaryotic life, like organisms like humans, animals, plants, the genetic information is all embedded in DNA. That is a language consisting of four letters, and this we call a genetic code. Mm -hmm. This DNA normally is translated in the RNA language, which is what we call the messenger. And the messenger will move to another factory in the cell where this language of RNA is translated in proteins. 
And proteins are the basic molecules that have activity, enzymatic activity, biochemical activity, and can trigger and catalyze certain processes. So the DNA and RNA are basically the codes in a row translates into proteins. So it's always from DNA to RNA into proteins, and proteins moderate activity. Mark? Maybe I can use a few more metaphors to try to make it clear to the listeners what DNA and RNA is. And uh, an example that we use frequently is, well, actually you could say that DNA is the, the hard disk of nature. So it, it contains an incredible amount of information on everything that can be done by nature. And DNA is a very stable molecule. And uh, so the cell has usually a bacteria has one copy of his DNA and uh, will take very good care of it. So you could see it as a, as a cookbook to make something, for instance, make a nice stew or something. And then if you would take this cookbook into your kitchen, then it could get filthy and it could get damaged. So you make a copy of it, you use the copy of one page to make something, and that's the RNA. So that's the working molecule of the DNA that also can get lost easily. You can just make a new copy of it. So the DNA is the stored information of nature that's in every cell, and the RNA is the working active part of the DNA that's being used at that point, and it's a bit less stable molecule. And usually viruses contain DNA, but there's, oh, there are also viruses that contain RNA, so they can have both of them. And how does it relate to protein? Yeah, the protein is what is being made by the cell from the recipe that is there in the RNA, in a way. So it's the molecules that are being built based on the RNA code. Because there is also like the, the protein transition. We have to eat more plant proteins or fungi proteins. To put things in perspective, what is a protein and how is that related to a virus? Okay, so maybe go to the most simple model of a virus. The most simple virus would be an RNA molecule from which that codes for two genes, what we call. So... Two information packages from this RNA can be translated in a protein. So the most simple form of a virus is an RNA virus that only codes for two proteins. And the proteins are basically the molecules, the keys to enter cellular processes, but basically hijack cellular processes to support the multiplication of new viral RNA progeny molecules, so new baby molecules that eventually become the new progeny virus. And the virus, as earlier said, if it's only an RNA virus, mostly it is protected by a capsid shell, so a protein shell. So the most minimal form of a virus would code for two proteins. One protein would be the code protein, so the shell, and the other one would be the replicase, the multiplying enzyme that multiplies the RNA molecule. But this multiplying enzyme At the same time, it's the key to access machinery of the cell to support and providing all components needed to make new RNA again. You're mentioning enzymes and a virus. What link is there? Well, enzyme is a protein, but enzyme is a biochemical term used to indicate this protein has an activity, is able to convert one thing into another or to engage in a process. But is, is a virus then an enzyme? The virus is not an enzyme. The virus is basically a particle containing a genetic element, an RNA element, coding for one or three proteins. And these proteins, once made in the cell, by the cell, will help again to multiply the RNA genome of the virus. Interesting. Uh, So the virus, you could see it as a sort of a mobile information package. Yes. Which is not self-supporting, but can self-replicate when it enters into another cell. Can we have an example to make this concrete? Yeah, yeah, I have maybe, maybe it's not the best example, but imagine you have a car and the car contains a chip which has all the information on how to build this car. And then you drive your car into some kind of a factory and the people there take, or a robot, take out the chip and read out the exact design of this car all the materials, uh, everything that it can do. And the machinery, the robot, just translates it into uh, 100,000 exactly the same cars. So you could see it like that. So the virus is nothing by itself. It just enters the cell. It contains all the information to replicate itself. 
by the life form, the bacteria or the plant or the human being or whatever yeah. is infected. Yeah. Mark, because you know a lot about bacteria and bacterial viruses. Can you share some thoughts and things you encounter in that area? Yeah. Actually, what the bacterial viruses are called phages or bacterial phages. So I will use the term phage then if you don't mind. But that's not because I like the term more, but that's just how you can find it in other information. So if you want to know more about the search for bacterial phage or phage, then you can find more information. We do not know that much about these bacterial phages, but for instance, they're very important as another form of antibiotics. So we use antibiotics actually to get rid of bacterial infections. I'm quite sure all of you know about that. And that's just a chemical that inhibits the growth or kills the bacteria, but it's not very specific usually. So it's uh, detrimental to all the bacteria in its surroundings or many bacteria. So they have usually quite a broad effect on bacterial cells. But the phages that can be used as another way of getting bacterial infections kill bacteria that they work very specifically so if you have a infection by a let's say klebsiella bacteria with you have a pneumonia then you could actually use the bacterial phage against klebsiella to treat your pneumonia very effectively and over the course of time uh, just before world war ii i think actually the western part of the world chose to develop the antibiotic the chemical antibiotics and promote them very bigly. So we are very highly dependent on these antibiotics in this society. But in a part of Eastern, especially Russia and Georgia, they kept on working with bacteriophages. And there are some institutes in Georgia, for instance, that use phage therapy to find mm -hmm. these bacterial infections. And they can be very effective and they are, do not have the side effects that the normal antibiotics have. So Actually, we see that a lot of antibiotics do not work anymore because you get so many resistant bacteria for these antibiotics. So a bit getting out of options regarding antibiotics. And then the phage therapy can be extremely uh, useful. How is that in your field, Richard? Well, I was going to add to this, what Mark said, is that besides using bacteriophages as an alternative to antibiotics, people are looking at the opportunities for using bacteriophages, for example, in food industry where listeria infections in chicken meat and exactly. especially the more elderly or the people that are more sensitive to disease would be protected by any food that is free from listeria. So people are considering using and looking at the possibilities of using bacteriophages to clean chicken meat and other components from listeria bacteria. Yeah. Several <laughs> products are already on the market that do that, that kill yeah. listeria on meat, for instance. So just you can spray the phages across the meat to kill this specific listeria wow. bacteria. So instead of chloride, yeah. we can use actually life again to sterilize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you don't add any chemicals. You only add these phages, which do not have any other effects except on these bacteria. It's so a, that's a wonderful way of dealing with it. And it maybe a, you can add here too is that if you go and you will look for it, you will find specific bacteriophages for certain bacteria. So without a wide spectrum target of bacteria. So you can treat only for specific bacteria. You can search for them, which is quite <laughs> beneficial because normally if you use antibiotics, it would be killing to the microbiome in your gut system. But if you now use bacteriophages that only specifically target some specific bacteria, you would leave the rest of the microbiome, you leave intact. Yeah, you leave the rest intact. intact, and that's a very yeah. important one. So actually what you can do with phages is to control or sort of influence the species composition of a certain population of bacteria. And uh, actually, if bacteria always compete for the food, if you understand. So mm -hmm. you have several species that are competing against each other, and only the one that grows fastest or the one that can take up the food the fastest or the best, that one will grow, will overgrow the other ones. So if that's not the bacteria that you need, for instance, I, for instance, we work a lot on degradation of contaminants. So if you could, you could steer this population, this natural population of bacteria, with phages in a certain direction so that you can get more contaminant degradation, for instance. That could be very useful. But then, Mark, 
to these viruses they mutate because they want to have an yeah. evolutionary advantage or that's yeah that's one of the things that viruses mutate constantly so in a way a bacteria of of course it's also a struggle between the bacteria and the virus or the or the phage bacteria are also trying to get rid of the phage of course but do not want the phage to do this so the bacteria get smarter and the virus gets smarter so they're constantly changing I might, Richard may know a bit more about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, many people may have heard about the CRISPR-Cas technology that now we can do gene editing and we can change any genetic code by using CRISPR-Cas. Mm -hmm. well, this is actually a, a defense system from bacteria to more or less be prepared for a bacterial phage infection. And... By having some of the codes of the bacterial phage in its own genome, the bacteria is prepared to recognize the bacterial phage again and kill it before it really harms the bacteria. But this is a very interesting mechanism on itself and that slowly also has entered all biology research and medicine research using this tool to change genetic codes with minimal collateral damage, as to say. But if I hear correctly, Richard, nature already does that. Yes, I believe personally, I'm already in science for a long time, but I'm still of, uh, by the time I retire, I think I've only been working on the tip of the iceberg and there is so much we don't know yet. And we only get to learn many of these by studying this. So basically what you're saying is that nature is already doing genetic modification, just hijacking. Oh, yeah. And yeah, all the time. Uh, for example, I, if I go into <laughs> the plant biology the work, I mean, you've all read about the situation that nowadays industry, breeding companies, but also scientists are able to genetically manipulate plants to build in genes and to allow plants to produce proteins coded by genes that we want the plants to use them as a kind of protein factory. Yeah? We can make genetic modified plants or to make them more resilient to pathogens. And this is using technology that is available in nature that is already being done by certain bacteria that have the capacity to build in certain sequences into the genomes of plants. And scientists just discovered that already 20, 30 years ago, and developed this technology and now using this technology themselves to build in any gene they wanted to build in. But then, of course, we are facing this societal reluctance. We don't want genetic modification. But it's a tool that's available in nature. Yeah, but then the CRISPR and natural genetic coding is two different things, in my opinion. But <laughs> <laughs> is also a basically a pathway that is already existing in nature. I'm not saying I'm pro or against the technology, but by generating and studying these kind of processes, eventually we get to learn how systems work. We can consider whether we want to exploit them or not. The point is viruses already do a lot of things that yeah. part of these we don't know yet. And what I'm learning from you, Richard, is that I would not be surprised if those who designed CRISPR maybe took viruses as a source of inspiration to come to these solutions. Because if, well, if I would see it differently. It's not that they look at viruses. There are always people that look at opportunities. Like, okay, if we know this process, is there anything we could we can exploit this in a beneficial way? And if it comes to let's say in general, human health and diseases. People always care about opportunities to help diseased. If you would have a kid that suffers from a rare disease, you probably would do anything to help, even if the possibility exists, to cure the kid. So that's why there is interest from medicine and geneticists to develop tools for gene therapy. Can we restore correct mutant genes into correct ones that one suffers not from a disease anymore. Yeah, to add on that, I found a paper called Viruses as Building Blocks for Materials and Devices by Fischlecher and Donach, published in 2007, where they actually are developing techniques by life size are becoming the basis of engineering approaches towards nanomaterials, opening a wide range of applications far beyond biology and medicine. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. This is oh. so weird. 
No, yeah, uh, it, there are a lot of words, but maybe to simplify, to give it an example, many viruses, they are protected by a protein shell. We call them a coat. Mm -hmm. And if you have the genetic coat that codes for this protein, the coat protein, then you can express this protein in a bacterial cell, in an animal cell, in an insect cell. You can purify this protein. And in many cases, we see that these proteins have the ability to self-assemble in a kind of virus-like particle. Yeah. And we can use that as a nanostructure to use it as a carrier. So we can even load these kind of virus-like particles with molecules inside the core, where normally the viral genetic element is. But now it's an empty shell, and we can load it with <laughs> a medicine or enzymes. And we can apply these molecules to have these taken up by animals, human, fish. And it can react to very specific surfaces also. So not all viruses stick to all cells. They have some kind of receptors. So they stick to certain kinds of cell uh, membranes, yeah. not to all of them. So they can be quite specific on where that you get your, your protein to. So, to so basically we could have a paint where certain viruses will be on and other ones will not stick to it because the structure is not in yeah. their preference. Yeah. And that's, so you can make actually these kind of molecules, you can make them specific to more or less stay in an area that people will know. Of. We all know and we all face flu viruses every year. Mm -hmm. So the technology is there. People have also shown that this works. You can actually purify an influenza virus that you grow in cell cultures And you can actually, by chemically treating these particles to more or less take out the genetic code, you make the particles free from anything. And you only have the virus particle left. So, so you just have the house. Yeah, you just yeah. have the house. An empty house. We call that a viral zone. <laughs> But you can put anything instead. You can load these particles with, let's say, a medicine. The point is, if you would have such a particle, specifically of this influenza, then you have a carrier that specifically and primarily infects the upper epithelial tract in your lung system. If you suffer from a disease in your upper epithelial lung system, you could even imagine that you make such a virosome of an influenza virus particle, load it with a medicine, and in a nasal spray, you more or less take it up, and your upper epithelial tract in the lung would receive the medicine and nowhere else because that's where influenza targets. Yes, yeah, like a Trojan horse. Yeah. So you can, if you study viruses and you know where these specifically target, you can make tissue-specific viruses. As Mark said, you need receptors for the virus to enter if it comes to an animal or human virus. Weird stuff, this, uh, Richard. It's not weird, it's interesting. <laughs> it's very fascinating, I would say. Yeah, so, Mark, Mark yeah. can you add on that? Oh, yes. Well, the fact that the viruses act very specifically opens many possibilities, I would say. So actually, you can try to stimulate those processes that are difficult to achieve on other mm -hmm. terms. For instance, a very interesting aspect of our work is that bacteria can degrade very complex molecules. We have had this PFAS discussion in the last year a lot in the Dutch news. And these PFASs, these are polyfluorinated molecules, they were called forever chemicals. They were meant to be stable forever, They were not to be cracked by any chemical or bacteria or whatever. And these forever chemicals now have been shown to actually be degraded by, uh, can be degraded by some kind of bacteria. And if we can put this bacteria or bacteria that are like, can also do this defluorination I mean, fluorinated molecules are about the most chemically toxic substances that mankind has ever produced. So it's not like something that is nice for a hobby or something, but it's actually <laughs> a big problem. <laughs> this PFAS is everywhere on the planet, even on the North Pole where you found these PFASs. And we don't know the long-term of effects of these kind of substances yet, but If we can find some bacteria that can degrade and defluorinate these molecules, and they can be helped in a way by viruses to do that, or to get rid of the bacteria that work against them or that compete against them, then it could be very useful. And actually, it's not, yeah, we don't know how this works for this 
PFAS is yet. So it's more thinking ahead 10 or 20 or maybe even longer years before we will be able to do things like that, I would say. But actually, it is known, for instance, for a bacteria like Vibrio cholera that can lose its ability to infect people or to be very virulent. But when it is infected by a virus, it can suddenly be very virulent again. So actually, a virus can enhance or decrease certain uh, capacities of these bacteria. So, right. um, yeah, you, being able to control or at least steer these kind of beneficial bacteria that degrade very harmful substances can be extremely useful, I think. Now you give this nice example in which maybe a bacteriophage might change the bacteria in such a way that it, it's more efficient in converting certain processes or maybe... Not at all. It's more or less similar as what I early in the introduction mentioned, that some plants may benefit from a viral infection being more resilient to drought and to stress. But at the same time, if you know the viruses well enough, and that's what we also do in our department, is that we can use viruses. For example, one example we do is a virus specifically for certain insects that only infects certain insects, actually the Lepidoptera, the caterpillar, and what we use this virus for is to grow this virus in cell cultures, but at the same time, we have put a gene inside this insect virus from which we want to have the protein produced in high amounts. So we use the virus actually because the virus keeps on multiplying. And the more copies you have, the more copies and amount of proteins you're producing will also increase because we have put this extra gene in that we want to produce. So we use the virus as a, in the cell culture as a production fab facility for a protein that would, we want to produce in high amounts, for example, for vaccines, this or for so weird. medicines, or whatever. I always use the five kingdom classification of nature with bacteria, fungi, algae, plants, and animals. But the way you're describing this, Richard, is that actually viruses should have their own kingdom taxonomy. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a complicating story. Officially, if you look at the tree of life, there are three branches, the archaea, prokaryotes, and eukaryotes. eukaryotes. The bacteria yeah. are part of the prokaryotes. And then we have the archaea with the eukaryotes. So the eukaryotes cover insects, animals, humans. But getting on this point, which is really interesting and fascinating, actually 15 years ago, they discovered what I earlier mentioned in our discussion, giant viruses. And they seem to potentially represent a fourth branch in life. Rich, for the clarity, how big is a giant virus compared to a regular virus? Well, the, normally <laughs> we always thought that viruses are small, smaller than bacteria. But this is a giant virus that is even bigger than small bacteria. And it has more than 1,000 genes. And a, a smart, simple virus only codes for one, two, three genes. And how many genes does a human have? 20,000. About okay. 20, 22,000. So this is a virus, only a virus, that needs to enter an amoeba for its replication. But itself, it already encodes more than 1,000 genes. And the interesting thing is, this virus, here it comes, can also be infected by another virus. No way. And that's what we call a viral phage. A phage, bacteriophage, like similar to bacteriophages infecting bacteria, this is a phage infecting viruses. And this is really intriguing. How come that this viral phage infects this, this large giant viruses? So, and so, 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 so. giant virus has a kind of system that's similar to CRISPR-Cas yeah. bacteria to defend against bacterial phages. How come a non-complicated virus Attack a complicated virus. You would say that the one is smarter than the other one. <laughs> I, don't get this question. I don't have the answer still. I just run into these publications yeah, that yeah. started about 15 years ago when people discovered a huge virus that was intriguing because this virus even codes for enzymes that are normally part of living organisms. Uh -huh. So that's why this was quite distinct from any earlier known viruses. Yeah, because so, I, I recall a, uh, another point we, we had before we joined this conversation is that actually we thought that viruses were the smallest particles, 
and yeah. that you screen them and you take out the bacteria and then whatever you find should be the smaller viruses. Yeah. But what you're saying, the giant viruses are even bigger than bacteria. Some so that's why we always miss them, because we always start off the concept that viruses in general are really small. You need an electron microscope to visualize. Yeah, well, and what is so, an electron microscope? You need to have very specific equipment. Yeah. Because you can use a microscope, a normal light microscope, that will be able to visualize material in a large 10, 40, 100, max 400 times. But which if you is, want to... Which is bacteria in, size? Yeah. If you want to zoom in more than 400 times, you need not light, but an electron beam. And it allows okay. you to look at much smaller units. So virus particles, the smallest ones are in the range of about 20 nanometers. And if you have bigger particles, they might go up to 100, 200 nanometers. But a giant virus is, is huge. It's Mark, most micrometers, I think, yeah. Explain what's going on in your thought. Mark is like nudging ah. and thinking, and it's always interesting to check on that. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing is that I think we generally tend to see viruses as parasites only. Why they are there, we don't know. Parasites and they're nasty, but... We really have to change our view now that we know more about viruses, that there are so many relationships between viruses and other, other life forms, I would say, so bacteria, plants, uh, whatever, that are pointing more towards uh, working together or some types of symbiotic relationships so that actually the, the two benefit from each other. And we should really know more about how this works and how we can promote and use those mechanisms. I mean, for instance, it's known now that in the nutrient cycles, so the cycle of uh, phosphorus and uh, nitrogen, yeah. viruses also play a very important role. I haven't studied this in detail, but you can think that uh, when leaves fall on the ground, they are degraded by microbes to larger molecules, and these microbes grow and grow and grow and grow. So there are a lot of these microbes in the top soil, the first centimeter of soil is extremely full of microbial biomass and then these viruses attack these bacteria and they explode but the nitrogen and the phosphorus is released again in the environment for other organisms and for other ways of life so if this wouldn't happen then we would be stuck with all this extreme loss of biomass and it appears that these viruses have a very important role in getting these nutrients back into the cycle it's amazing mark it sounds logic. Something has to be recycled, so something has to break before it can mm -hmm. move on in the next. Just to wrap up, Richard, how do you look back on our conversation and what has shifted your mind? I enjoyed the conversation. I'm always open to open discussions like this because as a scientist, one thing to know about the fundamentals, I'm always curious to see how this extends in other areas as well. I didn't know on this point that bacterial phages even, but I'm not surprised though, but I didn't know that even bacterial phage infections modulate maybe biochemical pathways in bacteria, which I think from the practical point of view, if it comes to innovations, I think I'm sure definitely there's <laughs> other interesting things to do on this although i'm the scientist i'm always into wanting to know how the systems work and i think and i believe i'm sure there's still so much to learn about viruses they are millions of years ahead of us yeah, yeah I, I understood that actually there are billions of years on the planet and they have a genetic oh, yeah. code which is so old it's like the like the elders of our society yeah 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 well i'm fascinated by micro life I worked a lot with, with bacteria and uh, I'm quite sure that the 21st century is the age of biology. So because of the, we can now read DNA, which we couldn't do in the, a century ago. So there's a lot, a lot of things that are in front of us. We don't know uh, many things about uh, viruses yet. So yeah, we will get the best of the findings in the next the decades, I think. And uh, uh, we have to find out how, how nature does it, all these interrelationships between life forms and how does the code of life DNA work in this respect. I'm really sure we can learn how to create all kinds of alternatives to uh, waste consuming or waste producing uh, chemical processes because we can do it in a much, much more efficient way. We can crack that nature's uh, 
box of gives Pandora's the, box of, of uh, things that yeah. can happen. So it gives agency for the future, which is uh, always good. Thank you for listening to the Master of Beautiful Achievements podcast. Subscribe so you won't miss future episodes. And if you find the podcast valuable, leave us a review on our website or on your favorite podcast platform where you're listening to my show.